And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua. I'm the honorary editor of the Sports Medicine Association of Singapore. And welcome to our Sports Medicine series on cycling medicine. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. We are very happy to have three distinguished speakers on our panel. Um, Mr. Michael Bushell, uh, Mr. Yo Bung Kiak, and Mr. Timothy Lim. Before we go into the event proper, let me introduce uh, to everyone a bit about what SMAS is about. So Sports Medicine Association Singapore is the registered society for sports medicine and sports science professionals in Singapore. So our members include sports doctors, general practitioners, um, family, uh, family physicians, uh, orthopedic surgeons, physiotherapists, podiatrists, dietitians and nutritionists, exercise physiologists, sports scientists, and sports psychologists. So if um, you know, you belong to, uh, do not belong to any of these uh, above, uh, you know, professions. Uh, we also have associate members, which include, um, you know, recognized coaches, athletes, and other professionals uh, in fields related to sports medicine. And this year, we actually have a new uh, category of student uh, membership. If you're a student of any of the above of these uh, professions, uh, you can also apply. Um, our website is over here, sportsmaster.org.sg, right? And you may uh, email us at smas.sectariat at gmail.com to inquire. These are our handles on Facebook and Instagram. Please note that uh, we will be recording this webinar. And by attending this event, you are hereby giving us your consent for your data to be captured and for such data to be used for our publicity purposes. Uh, please do not record the webinar. Uh, you'll be muted upon entering and you may post questions uh, using the chat function below. Uh, do note that we have a Q&A session at the back at the end of the of all our three speakers and so we will uh, we will be uh, not be having Q&A after each speaker. So please uh, 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 post your questions at the bottom and we will collect it for the end of the session. All right, please kindly give us uh, your feedback. Uh, you may scan the QR code for the link here, but we will also post this uh, link in the chat box at the end of the session for coaches who um, want to record their CCE hours, uh, uh, single, uh, Sport SG coaches, uh, please fill in the feedback form, then we can actually capture your name and your, um, you know, your, your, your coaching details. Uh, and unfortunately, for this session, we will not be, uh, be able to award any uh, Singapore Medical Council CME points. So uh, the program today will be first up uh, injury prevention strategies for cyclists by Mr. Michael Bushell, following by Mr. Timothy Lim's role of bike fit in preventing cycling injuries. Uh, as you can see that this event is uh, very special because it's in partnership with Okari Sweat. Uh, we'll be having a quiz at halftime um, where you may stand to win an attractive prize, right? So uh, keep an eye for that. Um, and finally, last but not definitely not the least, we have Mr. Yo Bung Kiak, who will be speaking to us about the foot shoe pedal interface in cycling. Uh, and as mentioned, we will be uh, concluding with a Q&A session at the end. All right, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to stop share and allow uh, my fellow ESCO member, Mr. Bala, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Michael Bushak. Bala, please. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, let me introduce our first speaker, Mr. Michael Bushell. Michael has 26 years of clinical experience having worked in Australia, the UK, Hong Kong, and now Singapore. He holds a master's degree from the University of Western Australia and is an Australian Physiotherapy Association titled Musculoskeletal Physiotherapist. Michael has achieved his diploma in sports physical therapy from the International Olympic Committee and holds a level one Australian strength and conditioning coaches certificate. Michael has extensive experience in mentoring and supervising junior physiotherapists and lecturing for fitness professionals. And he has worked in public and private settings along with the physiotherapy duties for various professional sports teams and also at the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. Please welcome Mr. Michael Bushell as he presents his talk titled Injury Prevention Strategies for Cyclists. Mr. Michael, please. Thank you very much, Bella, for your kind words. Uh, we'll get this screen going. Wonderful. So welcome everyone this afternoon. Uh, as Bala has mentioned, my name is Michael Bushell. Um, and this, in our first part of this series on cycling medicine, I'm going to discuss and outline some injury prevention strategies for cyclists. And I would also like to 
extend my uh, deepest gratitude to the Sports Medicine Association of Singapore for the opportunity to present to you all today. So I'm currently in my 27th year of physiotherapy practice and I've achieved various postgraduate qualifications and I've worked mainly in Sydney uh, with a couple of years working in the UK as an extended scope practitioner and also a few years in Hong Kong before finally I'm in my fifth year of practice here in Singapore. Um, I'm a keen cyclist myself and I also enjoy performing some high intensity strength training in the gym. So today we're briefly going to discuss the epidemiology of non-traumatic cycling injuries and outline some of the most common injuries. Uh, we'll introduce uh, some strategies to prevent cycling related injuries with our main focus on training load management and in that we're going to define the differences between mechanical stress and physiological stress and we'll also introduce this concept of workout modulation. And finally, we'll present some specific strategies to prevent cycling related injuries to various body regions, which is the lumbar spine, the knee, the neck, and the hand. So we know that cycling is an ever increasing sport and it's growing rapidly in popularity worldwide, um, especially since the pandemic began. Um, there's a continued push, push to increase its participation, which is driven mainly by the health, uh, the transport capabilities and the environmental benefits to not only us as individuals, but also to societies as a whole. Now, we know that more than 10 million people in the UK and 4 million people in Australia, they ride at least once a week and more than three times a week, respectively. And interestingly, it's been shown in a study that cycling to work is associated with less absence due to sickness. So this is a trend that is being continually encouraged by juris jurisdictions globally. Now, we know that cycling has very low injury rates compared to other sports, and that's with crashes and collisions included. Um, traumatic cycling injuries and overuse injuries are seemingly evenly distributed amongst both professional and recreational cyclists, with overuse injuries shown to represent about 50 to 60 percent of all cycling related injuries. However, when we take a closer look at, at how and analyze how most of the data is collated in those studies, it may be that overuse injuries are moderately underrepresented. It was found in one study that up to 67% of recreational cyclists continued to ride with high levels of pain. And it may be that when pain and injury is defined by athlete self-reporting measures, rather than activity time loss measures, there's a high representation of overuse injuries described in many cyclists. Uh, we also know that low back pain is reported by more than 50% of cyclists with pain and or injury to the lumbar spine and that causes the greatest amount of disability amongst cycling overuse injuries. And this is closely followed by the knee, being the second most reported body region for overuse injury in cyclists. Uh, furthermore, in another survey of 518 recreational cyclists, there were 440 overuse injuries or pain reported over a one year period. Now that same cohort of recreational cyclists, they displayed a high prevalence of lumbar spine and knee overuse injuries, followed by moderate amounts of neck pain, shoulder and hand pain. And we will outline some specific strategies that help prevent cycling related injuries to those body regions later on in this presentation. So overuse injury analysis in cycling, it's been based mainly on clinical expertise and anecdotal evidence. In fact, a recent systematic review found there was limited evidence of poor quality relating cycling overuse injury or pain to a bike fit, individual biomechanical factors or load related parameters. However, just as there's a lack of similar high quality evidence for the specific shoe prescription in runners, we know that an individual's perception of comfort on the bike 
is vital to present, prevent any unnecessary tissue stress. Uh, myself and my fellow speakers will argue that despite the lack of empirical evidence, the cyclist's perception should always be taken into account when choosing the most beneficial bike fit position, the foot shoe pedal interface, while concurrently managing their cycling training load as these factors, they play a significant role in overuse injury prevention and enhancing one's cycling performance. So now I'd like to elaborate on the concept of training load management. Now we know the main cause of overuse injuries is when the mechanical stress placed on our tissues, such as bone, tendon, and muscle, and or the physiological stress we're exposing ourselves to becomes excessive. And recently, the nomenclature for overuse injury has been renamed a training load error injury. And it's a consequence of simply placing too much load on our body too soon. And also, because this effect is cumulative, it can be very hard to identify before the pain arrives. So just what is mechanical stress? Um, it's defined by the resistant forces that are created by the acceleration and deceleration of our body against another opposing force. Now our bodies, they have enormous elastic properties when they're stretching and compressing against another opposing force. Um, when this happens, a resultant resistant force or mechanical stress is generated so we can regain the original shape of our bodies. Now, for example, when we're running, our body must generate large amounts of mechanical stress to resist the force of the ground we run on and the force of gravity. And this needs to be generated at very high rates due to the collision of our feet with the ground. Now, this is called a ground reaction force. And this is why there are many more running related injuries incurred compared to cycling due to this inherent lack of need to disperse ground reaction forces, unless you crash, of course. Now, similarly, but at a much lower end of the scale, during cycling, our body generates mechanical stress through the force of the pedals and the handlebars, the gradient of the terrain and the rolling resistance we're riding on. And there are no inherent impact forces. Quite simply, the gener without the generation of this mechanical stress, we'd not be able to move against these opposing, opposing forces. So we know that when there's adequate mechanical stress applied, a process called remodeling of the tissues occur, and then we generate some tissue adaptation. So when we're applying mechanical stress to our body, it's crucial if we want to become stronger and improve our cycling performance. And that process is called adaptation. I think we severely underestimate how well our bodies adapt to mechanical stress. So long as it's applied in a gradual and progressive dose, our tissues, including bone, tendon, and muscle, they adapt in a positive way by solidifying their structure. So long as the applied mechanical stress is smaller than the tissue's capacity to adapt. Now the correct balance of applied mechanical stress brings about a strengthening of the tissues and that's called remodeling. And this not only makes the tissues less vulnerable to injury, but it also allows it to cycle a little further and cycle a little faster. Now, conversely, an extreme example is when astronauts, when they return to Earth after spending time in the gravity-free environment of space, their bones are less dense, their tendons less resilient, and their muscles less toned. And their bodies then need to gradually adapt and their tissues need to remodel to cope with the forces of gravity their body weight and the ground when they return to earth. And that process can be quite long. So when there's excessive mechanical stress, tissue degeneration occurs and that may potentially result in injury. So we know that when the applied mechanical stress and the dose is greater than our body's capacity to adapt, our tissue respond in a negative way and then they weaken their structure. So doing too much cycling too soon can potentially lead to this training load error injury. Now the challenge for cyclists is in finding the right amount of mechanical stress applied to our tissues to create adaptation and not degeneration. Make a mistake with this and the risk of injury increases. And this is where a structured plan of cycling training can minimize the risk of incurring a training load error injury. And listening it to our bodies during the execution of that training plan is important because as we'll find out in a moment, life can often get in the way and we need to take into account the various physiological stressors that we encounter on a daily basis. So I'd like to draw your attention to this graph here. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we've got our 
time and, and our training activity. So we'll say cycling in this case. And on the vertical axis, we have our load. So we can see down the bottom left-hand corner, this cyclist has gone for a few easy rides because he's in the recovery and the rest zone where there's very low mechanical stress and generally no tissue adaptation. Then all of a sudden decides to join, join a cycling group and they've gone much faster and much further than he was physically prepared for. And that resulted in exceeding his tissues capacity. He either had pain during or after the exercise and morning stiffness. And I, no doubt we've all been in that situation. So of course, when feeling that specific pain, there was complete rest. He got himself a cycling coach and outlined a, an adequate training plan. And so they started to embark on some gradual and progressive cycling training uh, sessions and just keeping himself in that tissue adaptation zone. And as you can see in the black zone, the middle zone, uh, there's a little bit more mechanical stress applied, but not too much so as to surpass the red line into the injury zone. And so the graph of the tissue adaptation gradually increases. So the more he's training, the more tissues uh, can take that uh, mechanical stress and his adaptation can then improve his cycling performance and tissue resilience. So we see in order of sending uh, levels of mechanical stress of the following modes of exercise. So swimming and deep water running, which is in a relatively gravity free environment. We go to leisure cycling. This brings us to walking because there's a ground reaction force of that. High intensity cycling, which would involve interval training and some hill repeats. Then we go to jogging, running, downhill running and sprinting. And remember the body will adapt as long as the applied mechanical stress is not greater than its capacity to adapt. Now, this brings us to this concept of physiological stress. So what just is physiological stress? Now, well, it represents the physiological changes that our body experiences as a result of the workings of our nervous system, our hormonal or endocrine system, and our immune system. Now, bodily responses such as heart rate, blood pressure, metabolism, energy production, muscle tension, our breathing or our respiration rate and our perspiration, they're all influenced by the level of physiological stress placed on our body. And that's manifest in those bodily responses. I'd just like to outline some sources of physiological stress. So the first one is our physical responses to our cycling training. Now that will vary according to the intensity and the duration of a specific bout of cycling. For example, if we engage in consecutive long hard cycling sessions, that can induce large amounts of physiological stress upon our system. Another source of physiological stress is the emotional response that we have to our daily interactions, um, and particularly in our personal and our work lives. So during periods of high emotional stress, such as long work hours, excessive work-related pressures, periods of intense concentration, challenging personal relationships or simply raising a family, the levels of, of physiological stress that we experience can be sustained at high levels for prolonged periods of time. Um, another source of physiological stress is the quality and quantity of our sleep or more importantly, the lack thereof. And we know without that restorative influence of high quality sleep, both our physical and our psychological functioning can be compromised, which exposes us to higher levels of physiological stress, rendering our bodies to be less resilient. And finally, another source of physiological stress is when we have unfortunate periods of sickness and illness, which not only places a high demand on our immune system, but it also, also often requires a duration of convalescence. Um, and that increases the amount of physiological stress on our bodies, but it also reduces the amount of mechanical stress we're exposed to due to inactivity. And that can result in some physical deconditioning. So during these periods of high physiological stress, our body sends stored energy to our working muscles, but it also suppresses the functions of growth, repair, digestion, sex drive, and the immune system so as to conserve valuable energy. Um, if we continually expose ourselves to high levels of physiological stress, which is very typical in a modern life, that can create enormous demand on our body cells and increase our risk of sustaining a training load error injury, 
potentially resulting in overtraining syndrome and can even influence the dysfunction of our organs, leading to a greater risk of developing disorders and diseases later in life. So as cyclists, I think we need to consider the amount of physiological stress we're exposed to in order to balance the mechanical stress that we can safely apply to our bodies in order to avoid a training load error injury, minimize the risk of overtraining, and more importantly, maximize our performance. Now, while this principle of balancing the two types of stress is imperative for professional athletes, it's also important for you and I, as amongst other things, we all hold down a job that can take up the majority of our waking hours and raising a family, which can no doubt be both at times very stressful. And generally speaking, I think a lot of cyclists wildly overestimate their current capacities to cope with the demands of their training which often results in having to consult people like ourselves because of injury and illness. So how do we balance the physiological stress and mechanical stress? So I'd like to introduce this concept of workout modulation and that's, uh, we'll see how it can help. So modulating your workouts involves the consideration of the mechanical stress applied to your previous workouts, your current training session that's about to be undertaken and future workouts while constantly assessing the physiological stresses that you've been exposed to during your work and personal life. And that means thinking about what your cycling goals are, thinking about how you are feeling with regards to your current energy and vitality, and more importantly, being prepared to alter your training according to that assessment. We know that a well-designed cycling training program should always have the flexibility to modulate the workouts according to how the athlete feels from this uh, self-assessment of physiological and mechanical stress. Now, uh, this is a balancing act of manipulating the applied levels of mechanical stress during your training according to the levels of physiological stress you're experiencing in both our previous training and in our daily life. And that simply allows us to modulate our workouts to prevent a training load error injury. Now we know that when you're calculating the levels of mechanical stress, it is the intensity of your workout that's often more important than the duration. And conversely, when you're assessing the level of physiological stress, the duration of your workout is often more important than the intensity. So for example, when you're going through a period of low physiological stress, such as in very light cycling training and less work-life pressures, you can safely and gradually increase the levels of mechanical stress. So an example of this would be during a period when things are a bit quieter at your work and your cycling training has been held at a maintenance phase, it may be beneficial to introduce some high intensity interval training efforts very gradually over a two to three week period. And conversely, during periods of high physiological stress, such as in long duration, low intensity cycling training, or if you have a lot more work-life pressures, you should either transfer some of your training towards an activity with little or no mechanical stress, for example, like swimming, or simply back off the intensity and duration of your training until your levels of physiological stress decrease. Now, an example of this would be during a period when your work is very demanding to the point you're actually struggling to maintain your usual cycling training and you're not getting enough quality sleep, it may be beneficial to intersperse a few more rest days or some easy swimming sessions into your weekly training program. So now I'd like to introduce uh, some specific cycling related injury prevention strategies and we're going to start with the lumbar spine, the low back. Now we know that low back pain is almost ubiquitous amongst recreational cyclists and professional cyclists alike. And it can be often detrimental to our cycling performance. Um, when our low backs are sustained in a flex position for a long period of time, some of the normally resilient lumbar spinal tissues, they're placed on a sustained stretch. Now those tissues are highly viscoelastic and over a period of time, while they're in that sustained flex position on the bike, it can create a thing called tissue creep. Now, tissue creep is where those tissues 
become temporarily elongated and they can potentially create a nociceptive tissue strain in the form of sensitivity and pain and potentially become injurious. So this is why we need to manage our cycling loads. Simply avoid doing too much too soon. Very important, get a bike fit. Some very simple adjustments can vastly reduce the risk of excessive tissue strain. So an example might be if the saddle height is too high or the handlebars are too far forward, which causes excessive forward flexion at your lower back, it means your lower back is bending too far forwards. That may create some tissue creep and potentially some pain. It's important to change your saddle position regularly throughout a ride. And by simply intermittently sitting at the front, at the middle and at the rear of the saddle during a ride and getting out of the saddle regularly, that can reduce those sustain, sustained loads on your lower back. Intermittently rotating your pelvis anteriorly or tilting it forwards so you're flattening out your lower back throughout a ride, that can help prevent any uncomfortable tissue creep from your lower back being in a sustained posterior pelvic tilt or when you've been sustained in that rounded low back position for long periods of time. It's important to avoid pedaling at big gears for too long. We know that that causes a low cadence and it places excessive stress on your lumbopelvic region. And finally, strengthen your core muscles. Uh, we know that insufficient core muscle activation places greater cumulative stress on the lower back. So now I'd just like to uh, share a video with you on some easy core exercises for the lower back. Oh, Michael, maybe yeah. if you were, I think you need to stop share for your the PowerPoint. Then we will okay. need to reshare the YouTube, yeah. Okay, okay. Sorry, mate. No worries. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, we're back on. Yep. Great. Okay, the next most commonly injured area is the knee. We know that some presentations of patellofemoral pain, ITB syndrome, and infrapatellar fat pad impingement are the most common conditions experienced by cyclists. So, to avoid this, manage your training load. Don't do too much too soon. Get a bike fit. If our saddle height's too low, causing excessive knee bending or an incorrect cleat alignment, that might cause excessive torsional rotation at the knee. Avoid pedaling at big gears. We know that cause excessive stress on the structures at the front of your knee. Strengthen your core and your glutes. Insufficient core and gluteal muscle activation exercises that places more stress on our quadriceps, which can unnecessarily overload our knees. And stretch and lengthen your hip flexors and your hamstring muscle groups. That will reduce any excessive tension and enhance the activation of your gluteal and quadriceps muscles. 
The next most uh, injured area in cyclists is pain in around the neck, and that's often related to excessive weight bearing through the upper limbs. So once again, manage your cycling loads, get a bike fit. If the saddle height is too low, if the saddle is tipped too far forwards or the handlebars are too far forward, that can cause excessive neck extension, which means tilting your head upwards for too long. Ensure your helmet and your glasses fit properly and that they don't slide forwards. That will cause unnecessary and excessive neck extension, tilting your head up, which can cause neck pain. Avoid locking your elbows fully straight in extension and have them slightly bent, as that will recruit more of your arm and shoulder girdle musculature. In order to disperse more of the impact forces, the neck region has to deal with on a ride. Strengthen the deep neck flexor muscles and your upper trapezius muscles. We know that insufficient activation of those muscles places more stress on your neck. And stretch your upper cervical extensors, levator scapulae, and your pectoral muscle groups. That will reduce any excessive tension and enhance the activation of the deep neck flexor and upper trapezius muscle groups. And finally, we know that hand pain can be an issue for cyclists, with about 31% of cyclists reporting they've experienced some form of hand pain and localized paresthesia, which is pins and needles and numbness. Once again, manage your training load. Don't do too much too soon. Get a bike fit. We know that if your saddle height's too high or there is a downward tilted saddle or the handlebars are too low, that can cause your upper limbs to bear more weight through the handlebars. Strengthen your core muscles. We know that insufficient core muscle activation puts more load through our upper limbs and therefore we have to take the weight through our hands excessively. Change your hand position frequently on the handlebars. We know that by changing your hand position, that can disperse localized areas of pressure and avoid pain. And ensure your gloves fit well. Make sure they're not worn out and that your handlebar tape is sufficiently reinforced. Um, we know that these small changes can help disperse high pressure exerted through our hands when we're cycling. So in conclusion, if we had to highlight the most important strategies to prevent injury during cycling, We'd manage our training loads, trying not to do too much too soon. We'd get fitted to our bike by an expert. We'd strengthen our core muscle groups and we'd change our position on the bike regularly throughout a ride. So here's a list of our references that I've used for this presentation today. And if anyone would like a copy, please contact me and I can email you the list. And on behalf of myself and my cats, we'd like who helped in creating this presentation today. Uh, we'd like to thank you for your time and your attention today. And I can be found at InTouch Physiotherapy, which is a part of the ProHealth Asia International Group. And we have a comprehensive scope of physiotherapy practice services. Thanks once again. Uh, thank you, Michael. If anyone has any questions uh, regarding his presentation, uh, do drop it in the chat and we will address it uh, at the end of uh, everyone's presentation as well. Yeah? So without further ado, let me introduce our next speaker, Mr. Timothy Lim. Timothy has been a bike fitter for 12 years and is accredited as a level 4 bike fitter by the International Bike Fitting Institute. In 2013, he established Louis Bicycles, a bike, bike fitting lab focusing on providing bike fitting services and education for aspiring fitters in the region. Louis Bicycles has been collaborating with research institutes like NTU, the Public Polytechnic, to conduct research on cycling biomechanics, as well as the development of tools for cycling biomechanics analysis. Timothy holds a Bachelor of Engineering Honours in Mechanical Engineering. He was a national cyclist from 2009 to 2013 and raced with the OCDC Singapore Continental Cycling Team. Now an avid Ironman triathlete, he enjoys traveling to races with his wife and three kids. Please welcome Mr. Timothy as he shares on role of bike fit in preventing cycling injuries. Timothy, please. Hi guys. Thanks, Bala, for the introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's the volume okay? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah my screen, yeah?
Yep, looks good. Okay. So today I'll be speaking about uh, the role of bike fitting in cycling injury prevention. And uh, yeah, I think I think Bala has really introduced myself, so I will I will I'll just skip this part for now. So in today's presentation, we will discuss uh, bike fitting. What is it, and uh, how it can help? Some common cycling injuries, which uh, Michael has also already covered, and also some uh, prevention strategies through through bike fit, and how uh, these common cycling injuries can be uh, alleviated. And we'll go through some case studies as well of the common cycling injuries. So, um, what what is bike fitting? Essentially, it's a cycling biomechanics analysis process to improve the human bike interaction. And this uh, involves adjusting a bicycle to fit into an uh, adaptable human body. It also involves a selection and uh, the recommendation of the right components, bike size for each uh, unique individual, for their goals and needs, and also the correction of uh, uh, posture and technique for each cyclist. And all this with a goal to improve comfort, increase power, uh, be more efficient on the bike, and also to prevent injury. So, so why, why do people do a bike fit? There are four main reasons. Um, basically, the first in the no order of preference is for purchase. So as we know, that a, a bicycle, especially like a road racing bicycle, can can be quite expensive. So, so to in order to buy something that fits well, and not to make the wrong purchase decision is important. And then, of course, uh, one of the most important reasons for bike fit is also to deal with pain. And uh, pain can can come in two, can come in two forms, from trauma, as uh, Michael has mentioned, with crashing, crashing and falling, and also from obvious injuries. As you know, cycling is a repetitive uh, movement sport. So people usually get injuries over time or can get injuries over time. To improve, improve performance, whether it's for, for more power, more aerodynamics, and also the last is to prevent any injuries. So really any bike can be fitted, whether it's a road bike, mountain bike, whatever bike or a tri bike. If, if you ride the bike with commute or or to race, or just for leisure, you know, a bike fit is, uh, is relevant. So the different types of bike fit that's being uh, provided now, yeah, the most common is of course experience based. When you go into a bike shop and you buy a bike, uh, they can put you on a trainer and then they can assess you and, and through the experience of the, the retailer, they can, they can set you up into a position that based on their perspective, it's good for you. And then also, also there's a, a more data-driven approach, and this is getting more and more popular these days with uh, a lot of sy systems being adopted in bike shops, such as V2, IDMAT, and uh, Google Fit systems. And these uh, data-driven processes are largely um, based on normative ranges. So they have collected a lot of uh, data points from uh, many, many bike kits that have been done before. And they use these normative ranges to fit people into certain fit ranges. And there's also a more clinical approach, which involves uh, health professionals, intervention like a physio, uh, podiatrist, and they can and they can fix certain functional issues before they actually um, adjust the bike to accommodate to someone's needs. And then lastly, evidence base, which is a bike fit process that is. Uh, based largely on research and also um, good data, uh, clinical studies that have been done before. And, uh, there's no, there's no one real type of bike fit that's superior, and um, it depends at a point in time what a client needs. So, for example, if someone is uh, just starting out to cycle, maybe uh, experience based bike fit will be sufficient. Someone who has a long history of injuries, even prior to starting cycling, maybe a clinical one would be more relevant. 
yeah, so some, some, of, some of the technologies that have been used and adopted today, a lot of uh, um, systems to be able to measure movement, to be, to be able to measure um, pressure and contact points, to be able to measure movement even when you're cycling on the road, and also like uh, tools to measure aerodynamics real time. So what are some of the common cycling injuries? From, um, from, from our database, we have, uh, we have seen almost spot on cyclists since 2011. And uh, majority of these bikes that we have seen are road bikes. And 44% of these cyclists actually complain of some form of pain or discomfort. Yeah, so a lot of cyclists actually assume that um, this pain is, is normal and part of the sport and something that they should get to, but it's not really true. Sometimes they don't, they don't even know that something is uh, abnormal. So if you, if you pee blood after cycling, then maybe something is wrong. So, um, yeah, Michael has presented some, some uh, studies and, and also uh, prioritize like which injury is most common. Uh, based on our database, hand numbness is uh, one of the hand or finger issues, one of the most common um, cycling complaints, followed by back pain, back pain primarily in the lumbar region, lower back, and then saddle related issues, followed by knee related, neck and shoulders, and then foot related. Yeah, so again, I, I will speak more about overuse injuries here instead of uh, trauma. Yeah, so you can see here, that's based on this year's, uh, the, the customers that we see this year, yeah, most of them compared, uh, com complain about hand related issues, followed by the low back, and then the saddle, knee, neck and shoulders, and the feet. So there's this uh, study also done by a German sport you know, university, and they have uh, also question, done a questionnaire for about 800 cyclists, leisure recreational cyclists in Germany, and they figured that most people complain of pelvis and saddle discomfort when riding, followed by neck, and then some, some form of finger um, numbness issue, low back, followed by knees, and then hands. Yeah, but if you add up the fingers and hand issue, it actually also, um, it's a majority of the issues. Yeah, so let's speak more about some hand related injuries and issues. So of course, these issues are largely caused by excessive pressure on hands when riding. And uh, yeah, some common injuries that can lead to that would be like carpal tunnel syndrome, which involves a, a compression of the nerve in the hand. It, it depends on where the hands are placed on the, the handlebars. So different points of the, the hand pressure can cause different types of nerve compression. And of course, blisters, calluses on the, on the palms are also quite common. So this um, excessive weight on the hands for prolonged periods, the, hand, the wrong type of handlebar width, shape or type, the position of the foot, um, sometimes even the wrong kind of gloves, anxiety yeah some some cyclists that they are new on the roads and they are anxious when they are cycling on the road with traffic they tend to grip very hard onto the on the boots and then that can cause a lot of hand issues as well and of course yeah funny enough is that sometimes when the saddle is not very comfortable you tend to not like to sit on the saddle as much so you tend to rest more on your hands rather than sitting down on the seat So going, going into lower back injuries, yeah, this involves uh, this herniation, inflammation, and muscular issue. And of course, uh, this can be caused by excessive pelvic movement from the hips. And with the saddle being too high, the hips can start to rock left and right, causing a tissue creep, as per what Michael has mentioned. And tight hips, poor pelvic mobility, and lumbar flexibility, 
like excessive uh, posterior rotation of the pelvis can cause low back pain as well. And the bars being too far and too low. And again, um, yeah, saddle discomfort can be a co common denominator here. If the saddle being a bit uncomfortable, sometimes uh, the cyclists can intentionally rotate their hips backwards, causing a lot of stress on the low back. And yeah, saddle discomfort is a uh, is a issue that's also quite um, prevalent in cyclists. Some of the common injuries can be it can affect uh, sexual health, like erectile dysfunction, skin issues, C's, numbness in the in the soft tissue region, perineal pressure, and then sometimes people also can have excessive pressure on the sit bones. Sometimes it can be on one side of the sit bone, one side of the soft tissue, as a result of functional asymmetry. So if your pelvis is not rested squarely on the saddle, which is a common issue, then sometimes saddle issues can be only on one side. Yes, some of the causes can be um, choosing an incorrect saddle or either that or a saddle, saddle being set up wrongly. So the saddle can be good and correct, but because it's not set up correctly, the cyclist is sitting on the wrong spot on the saddle, it can cause issues. So these issues are not uh, mutually exclusive. Sometimes uh, they can occur together and they also can be a result of one another. So like as I mentioned before, the um, saddle issues can cause hand numbness. Saddle issues can also cause low back discomfort. So we always try to find what's the, the root cause of the problem in a bike fit to solve and uh, to solve the problem. So how can a bike fit help? Usually the process of a bike fit will start with an interview to uh, truly understand how cycling fits in the, into the, 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 the cyclist's life. Like some, uh, 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 the goal of a leisure cyclist and a recreational cyclist can be very different from a, a high level amateur compared to a professional cyclist. And then we will also um, proceed to do an, an analysis of the bike to understand the fun function the range of motion and uh, any stability or movement issues that the person has. And then we look at the person on the bike, measure movement, me measure pressure on the contact points. And then from there, we can compare and um, come up with a hypothesis as to what are, are the root causes of the potential issue. Then make changes to the position from there. And uh, maybe it's a positional issue, maybe it's an equipment issue, maybe it's a technical issue. We make changes and then we reanalyze to, to check. So of course, all this is done in in usually a studio setting. And then uh, once once uh, the session is completed, after a few weeks, we'll check back with, uh, the plan for review. And uh, yeah, also bear in mind that a bike fit is usually point in time. At that point in time, based on the person's or cyclist's function, how he or he move on the bike, the bike feels relevant at the point in time. So for example, if uh, one year later someone puts on weight or get injured or lose weight, his or her function will change, so will the bike feel. So some of the cons considerations when doing an analysis includes, like mentioned before, movement, kinematics, we measure the movement and joint angles of the cyclist, we measure pressure on the contact points, and it also has to be realistic. So for example, if, uh, if a cyclist complain of saddle issues, especially when he is climbing, then the bike has to be assessed, of course, with the bike in incline position, simulating climbing, and also with a, a realistic load on the trainer. And we also want to consider off the bike range of motion and function versus on the bike range, range of motion and function. So sometimes, the issue that a cyclist has can already be identified off the bike. So it's already an existing issue and it's not really bike or cycling related. And then a uh, good posture and technique. We also have to be able to, to um, use parameters like stability, the quality of movement and uh, power. 
So if, if we can uh, measure power and efficiency with uh, good tools like uh, pedal, now power meter pedals and power meter cranks can have such a function. And of course, comfort. Comfort is it's really subjective. So it's, of course, um, we have to constantly check back with uh, the client whether a position is good or bad. And then, uh, yeah, treatment versus accommodation. So sometimes when uh, there's an existing issue, like a uh, cyclist complain of an existing lower back issue, if it's something that a position can be accommodated to, then of course we'll do that to alleviate the pain. But if it's already an injury that requires uh, like a physio or a medical intervention, then of course treatment becomes more relevant. So as mentioned before, comfort is, is uh, highly subjective. So it's important that we are able to balance objective measurement with a uh, subjective feeling. So in a bike fit, we can measure everything to be perfect and everything to be good in good order, good movement, low, low pressure, no pain. Um, and we can assume there's no pain, but then uh, uh, the cyclists can say that, oh yeah, they still don't feel good. Then of course, then we have to look further into why. So it's a constant balance between objective measurement and subjective feedback. So that, that's why it's important for the bike fitter to be able to discern and make important decisions. So let's just uh, look at some case studies. And uh, the first case would be a hand numbness. So if a client comes in and complain of hand, hand numbness after about an hour of cycling, 30 kilometers, obviously then we can measure and see that, oh yeah, maybe there's excessive pressure on the hands. And let's say if, if it's unilateral, more on the left side, we have to understand why. So the objective of a bike fit would be, able to, would be to reduce weight on the hands and to reduce the maximum pressure on the hoods. Yeah, so this can be done with a physical assessment, like checking um, their, their core strength, um, analyzing their movement and using pressure analysis tools. Yeah, so, so for example, if you look at the, this cyclist here, um, on, the, on the picture on the right side, you can actually see that he's actually positioned more upright after a fit. And by doing, by putting him, him in a more upright position, moving his pelvis and his handlebar backwards towards the rear view, you can actually move the load away from the hands and more on the saddle. So, so weight on the bike can actually mainly go in three places. The foot, the saddle and the hands. So if we assume that the power from the trainer, the load is constant, then we play around the distribution between the saddle and the hands. And so with, with uh, pressure mapping tools, you can actually look and measure how much more weight there is on the saddle. So with the same load, an increased amount of weight on the saddle means that there's less weight on the hands. And uh, we also want to uh, assess the maximum pressure on the, on the hands and, and things like increasing the area of the pressure distribution on the hands, like adjusting the hood position or, or, or using gloves, we can spread the weight on a larger area, which will, which will reduce the maximum pressure on the hands. So going to saddle issues, um, usually it's, we talk about uh, perennial pressure, which cause uh, numbness. So we, the common question is always to ask whether it's a saddle issue or a saddle setup issue or both. So the saddle issue of course means that uh, the choice of saddle has to be right. Uh, the saddle set, if it's a saddle setup issue, it can be the right saddle but set up wrongly. So saddle setup meaning the saddle height, the saddle four and a half, or the saddle tilt. So from, from assessment, you can actually first use a direct observation, which is just by looking. And uh, we, if you do a physical assessment, and we check that off the bike, uh, the cyclist or the person has a uh, good pelvic flexibility and mobility. But on the bike, he exhibits the opposite. Then likely there is some saddle issues. Or from indirect observation, you can also observe movement and with measuring tools, and also with a uh, saddle pressure analysis tool. Yeah, so again, on the, on the, for this cyclist off the bike, 
he, he has actually limited pelvic mobility and and um, so he, he, he wouldn't be able to rotate his pelvis anteriorly on the saddle. So on the picture on the left, with the handlebar being too low, he's actually forced to lean forward excessively. And hence there's a lot of pressure on the soft tissue on the seat. So on the right, when we have when we raise the handlebar, we actually managed to resolve his saddle, saddle um, issue just by just by allowing allowing him to sit uh, properly on the bike by rotating his pelvis backwards. So sometimes if it's a, it's a saddle related issue, but the solution is to adjust the handlebar. So you can see. Um, so this uh, image has no relation to what we had before. Yeah, so it's just an example of a pressure net and a, a, a different saddle for a same cyclist in the same position. So on the left, if a saddle choice is wrong, you can actually measure and identify that um, there's a high pressure point on the soft tissue region. And then with, a, with the correct saddle, you can actually um, give good perineal relief and with the with the pubic remind or pubic bones rested on the on the right part of the saddle. So it brings us to the next case study. So the cyclist can can also experience uh, not just soft tissue pressure on the saddle, but but a constant pressure on the sit bone that can cause discomfort. So in this case, we, we look at the pressure map on the left. We see that there's excessive pressure on the left. Is here, the left seat bone. And, uh, based on assessment, actually this is caused by a leg length difference. Yeah, so actually, once we once we chin or we add length to the shoe, we can actually have a more even saddle pressure distribution. So again, yeah, that's that's a form of intervention where a bike fitter can can make, you know, just add a shim, but then we can further verify that with an X-ray, and then we can check that. Their leg is truly, actually shorter or longer. Their leg length difference can come in come in two forms, right? It can come in a, the bone being actually longer or shorter, or or if it's a functional issue like a hip can can also cause a leg to appear longer or shorter. So we look at our case study three, which is a low back pain case. Um, low back pain can be unilateral or bilateral. So in this case, if you have, for example, a unilateral uh, low back pain issue only on the right side, and then if it's an hour of cycling, it, it's uh, caused by a pelvic block. So excessive hip movement if a saddle is too high. Yeah, and and uh, if a saddle is too high, usually it forces a cyclist to compensate by wanting to find a lower seat height and what they'll do is they'll scoot, for, scoot forward on the saddle because on the front of the saddle it's actually closer to the pedals so when, when it happens the hips actually rest on a more narrow portion of the saddle and then it causes the hip to be able to rock left and right whereas if it's rested on the larger wider part of the saddle it's like a platform so the pelvis is more well supported so you look at the image on the left you can see that Constantly, there's a, the, a constant dipping of the right side of the, the pelvis, which cause some pain on the, the lower back on one side. So it's either with either right seat height or with uh, shimming, you can actually allow the pelvis to rest more squarely on the saddle, elim eliminating the lower back, uh, the unilateral lower back pain. So I, I'm moving on to a, a next case study which involves a knee. Yeah, so for example, if someone has anterior knee pain, the front of the knee hurts. It can be related to uh, tight hips and uh, right rectus femoris issue. So the thigh muscle on the quads. And uh, what a bike fitter can do is actually to adjust the position to open the hip angle and to have uh, to introduce shorter cranes or to make the bars higher. So when the bars are higher, there's more space at the hip area. When the cranks are shorter, there's more space on the hip area as well because the knee comes up less. So we can also ensure that um, with a saddle pressure or motion analysis tools, we can ensure that the hips are stable and that the, the saddle 
So they said promotes the use of hamstring instead of the quads. And uh, with a uh, physical help, you also can um, have other strategies to manage the issue, like a uh, trigger point therapy or dry needle. So in conclusion, I, uh, I would like to say that bike fit is uh, truly important to help in uh, making a, the right purchase decision. We also allow a proper bike setup to prevent uh, potential obese injuries. The bike fit should also correct technique and posture and allows for a good quality of movement based on each individual's function. So with a combination of uh, good research, knowledge, uh, attention to detail, good uh, measurement tools, peer review, uh, a well-executed bike fit can be extremely effective and beneficial. I would also, I also like to say that uh, bike fit, bike fitting is a very uh, niche field and it doesn't really have a um, like governing body to, to watch over good practice. So yeah, but yeah, yeah I think it's, that in the, in the UK, they are slowly trying to establish that and to have an authority to have a way of accrediting bike fitting. Yeah, so that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timothy. Thanks, Timothy. Yeah, um, just a reminder to everyone to post any burning questions you have in the Q&A, and we will take it uh, at the end uh, after uh, Mr. Yo's talk. Um, now we will have a half-time break of sorts where uh, we will invite our partner, Pukhari Sweat, to hold a quiz. Um, for those of us who weren't, uh, who didn't, who joined us a bit later on, I think you would uh, see that how this uh, sports medicine series um, session is a bit different. Uh, besides the blue black ground, um, you know we are actually in active uh, partnership uh, with Pokari Sweat since last year, and I think um, this time we will invite uh, Mr. Nelson from Pokari Sweat to uh, hold the quiz where we stand to win some prizes or a prize. <laughs> Nelson, if you're able to share the screen. Yeah, Nelson, we can see the Kahoot site first. Yeah. The sound is on. Sorry, Nelson, I think you're muted. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Once again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nelson from Pukari Sweat. Yeah, so, Pukari Sweat is the pub. It's proud to be the official hydration partner for um, the Sports Medicine Association of Singapore. So today, we are given the opportunity uh, to do a short engagement with everyone uh, during this webinar for the Sports Medicine um, series. Uh, so for today, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to uh, know a little bit more about Pokari Sweat. All right, so we're going to yeah, understand a bit more about the brand uh, through a simple game of uh, Kahoot. Lah. Yeah, so I see um, everyone's really slowly to start, starting in to join. So... Um, Yep, so simply we'll, you can follow the link and then key in the game pin and then um, you can stand by to play the game. Lah. Right, so um, you join the game and then um, so we will have a total of six questions. So um, after every question, we will collate the point and after six questions, uh, we will have uh, one winner. Right, so the top uh, winner will stand will win a UE Wonder Boom speaker, lah, which uh, the worth is $129. Right, so... Um, the questions itself uh, will be a, either a true or false question or be a multiple choice question. So if you're the fastest to choose the correct answer, you get additional points as well. Okay, so uh, before we start the game, um, we will go through a short video um, so everyone knows uh, what Procurator is about. All right, so we'll start. Nelson, we actually can still hear the Pokari 
we still can hear the Kahoot back. Okay, it's better now. Can. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I hope everyone um seen the video, pay close attention to the video and know a little bit more about Pokari Sweat. Okay, so next um we'll start um the Kahoot game itself. So uh, maybe we wait for another 10 seconds for everyone to um come into the game before we start. Okay, um yeah, I think everyone is in. We will start the game now. Oh ah, yes. Okay, maybe. Okay, another five seconds. Okay, and then let's uh, begin. Right, so our first question, uh, Pokaisa is developed by a Japanese uh, blank company. So the answer, first option is pharmaceutical, beverage, wine or um, juice company. Yeah, so the answer is correct, it's a pharmaceutical company. So, um, currently at the scoreboard, we have um, Baoying leading um, with 884 points. So, yeah, so for us, um, Pokasa is founded by a pharmaceutical company. So, uh, for us, uh, Otsuka is our parent company, right? So, um, we have two parts to the business itself. For, first is the pharma side. So, it's um, working with um, mental health um, medication and um treatment second part will be the nutraceutical site which is um for example for curry sweat and then in on the japan side we also have um, other products uh, which um help to um yeah uh, help people worldwide with uh, healthier and active lives all right so our next question so our question number two when did uh for curry sweat partner with smes to provide our uh, insights on hydration and sports medicine topics so is it uh in april 2021 May 2021, April 2022, or May 2022? Yeah, so the ans correct answer is in um, May 2021. Yeah, so in the leaderboard, yeah, Powering is still um, leading with 1,718 points. And then, yeah, the answer is um, May 2021. So since May 2021, SMES and Pokari Set have uh, partnered to educate on the hydration, on tips on hydration and share sports know-how to the performing um, athletes, high-performing athletes, as well as the general public. Lah. So the next time you go to your uh, shops, your giant NTUC whatsoever, when you grab a bottle of Pokari Set, when you turn over the bottle, you get to see um, SMES logo uh, printed on our bottles as well. Lah. So moving forward will be question number three. So uh, if you all pay attention to the video, you all will know this. So what idea inspired the creation of uh, Pokari Sweat? So is, is it uh, sea water? Is it uh, tap water, purified water, or uh, drinkable IV solutions? Yep, I guess uh, everyone, um, most of us got it correct. Yep, so we can see here, yeah, Powering is still uh, leading. Lah. So now with uh, 2,589 points. Right, so answer is yeah, I uh drinkable IV solution. So uh, we are inspired by the idea of drinkable IV solutions. Pokari said is healthier choice uh beverage that um we replenish our lost water and ions like, after we exercise and after we sweat. So fourth question, uh, what is Pokari sweat's competition similar to? Is it uh similar to 
your tears or is it drinking water or is it alcohol or is it uh, body fluids? Lah? Yeah, so the answer, correct answer is um, body fluids. So yeah, we still have a bowing leading lah, 3,474 points. And then yeah, the correct answer is um, prokaryotic composition is close to our body fluid. Yeah, so it is quickly absorbed into our body and replenishes what is lost whenever we sweat through sports and through exercise. So for question number five, when was Pokhari sweat developed? So is it uh, 1980, uh, 1985, 1965, or is it uh, 2022? Right, I think um, move on with Boeing still leading. Yeah, so the answer is um, Pokhari sweat is um, yeah, officially hit the shelves in the uh, 1980s. Lah. So it's after uh, 1,000 uh, variations of trying out the different combination of the drinks. And then that's how we get Pukaiset that is today. So today Pukaiset is a big part of sporting and popular culture. Lah. So for Pukaiset, we supported uh, sporting events. We were very into um, sports and running. And then uh, for pop culture, we do have um, mentions in animes and then as well as a uh, strong culture in uh, the whole um, J-pop or the whole K-pop um, scene. La. And then last question, what is Pokai Shirt uh, less sugar variant um, called? La? Is it um, Pokai Shirt less uh, reduced sugar or Pokai Shirt less sugar? Uh, is it uh, Pokai Shirt light or is it uh, Pokai Shirt ion water? Yeah, and moving forward. So yeah, the less sugar variant is called um, Pokai Shirt ion water. La. So some key benefits of ion water is um, is uh, less sugar, is a uh, light and refreshing, yes, a light and refreshing taste. It also benefits you uh, in terms of hydrating the loss, the ions and the electrolytes that you lost, as well as um, another key um, aspect of uh, water is it can be consumed uh, in uh, room temperature and uh, taste as good as well. Okay, and then from here, we're going to uh, summarize the, all the questions and the points. And then on third place, we have uh, Roger, congratulations. And then getting five out, uh, out of six is a uh, TLC, and then lastly, getting five out of six as well is uh, Pao Wing. Alright, so congratulations, Pao Wing. So uh, we will uh, contact you guys, we will contact the winner, okay, we'll contact you, and then uh, to arrange the price delivery to you. Alright, so congratulations again, Pao Wing. Uh, you have won yourself uh, one piece of the UE Wonder Boom 2, which is worth $129. Alright, so um, other than that, um, lastly, will be um, a small treat for everyone, right? So um, we also have this um, current promotion ongoing with our um, e-commerce platform that we're working with, which is our Grocery Hour. So when you go on to Grocery Hour, you can also purchase Pukari Sweat. And then on top of that, you still you also get um, the certain discount, la, right? So um, on the left side, you buy two cartons of Pukari Sweat, either um, iron water, or Pokari Sweat itself, you get $5 off if you enter the code uh, Pokari5. And then if you are looking to purchase um, the sashi, which is the powder form, um, same thing, you go on to um, Grocery Hour, you add to cart, and then you key in the code Pokari8, you get um, $8 off uh, one carton of um, the Pokari Sashi. La. Okay, so this one, I think um, that's all I have for everyone. Everyone can quickly take a screenshot. Uh, you guys are interested to um, yeah, use the promo code to get a discount. Okay, yeah, other than that, uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope everyone um, had fun playing the Kahoot game. At the same time, everyone also uh, know a little bit more about uh, what Pukari Sweat is. And then um, also, if you're interested to find out more, um, sporting events coming up, um, you can always follow our social media at Pukari SG, which is our Instagram, and then uh, Pukari Sweat Singapore, which is our Facebook account. All right, uh, thank you so much. And yeah, over back to you, Dr. Josh. Hey, hi, uh, thanks Nelson. Yeah. Um, yeah, continue to keep your questions that are coming in through the chat. We will address it at the end of the presentation. Um, okay, let me introduce our next presenter. Last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Boon Kiak. Boon Kiak is an avid cyclist and podiatry, as well as a big lover of all things sports. His most recent position was head of podiatry and senior podiatry of Woodland Health. He was nested at Kutek Port Hospital and was the lead of the sports podiatry service after spearheading its setup. As an athlete himself, he Clinical interests are in podiatric sports medicine and injuries, 
and biomechanical abnormalities of the foot and ankle. He is currently training full time and preparing to represent Singapore at the 2022 Sea Games in Hanoi before starting a position as principal podiatrist at Core Concept from June. Please welcome uh, Boon Chak as he presents the foot shoe pedal interface in cycling. Uh, Boon Chak, please. Yep, we can see the screen. Boon Chak, need to unmute yourself. Ah, am, I, am I muted now? All right, loud and clear. Oh, sorry, hang on. Um, sorry, it's been a while since I presented on Zoom. <laughs> hang on, just let me um, fix this again. Okay, can you hear me now? Right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks, Bala, for the very kind introduction. And uh, a big hello to everyone uh, from Chiang Mai, where uh, the Singapore uh, national team is based um, uh, and preparing for the SEA Games. Uh, I just want to start by saying it's a great honor to speak alongside um, the uh, illustrious speakers, uh, Michael and, and Tim. And uh, thank you, SMAS, for the great opportunity to, to speak on, uh, on, on, uh, at this event. Uh, well, today I'll be speaking on a topic that is actually uh, very close to my heart, um, the uh, foot shoe pedal interface in cycling. Um, this is where uh, my professional and my uh, recreational interests uh, meet. Uh, personally, I've been uh, cycling for about 15 years, uh, majority of the time uh, competitively. And um, hence, I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking uh, about this topic, both as an athlete, uh, but also as a clinician, uh, trying to uh, help others uh, uh, improve um, their performance and stay injury free uh, uh, with not too, not too dissimilar goals uh, as myself. Uh, cycling has grown to become a uh, very popular sport uh, both in Singapore and, and in the world uh, and I'm very very happy to be able to speak on this topic so without further ado uh, let's begin. Yep okay so um, the first thing, the first uh, uh, point I want to touch on is that uh, the foot shoe pedal interface is one of the, the three main contact points uh, between the cyclist and, and the bicycle, uh, the saddle and the handlebars being the other two. Uh, and because it is, uh, uh, it is the interface which uh, the lower limb attaches to the, the bicycle and, and it's responsible for the forward propulsion of, of the machine, uh, it deserves uh, special attention. Uh, to better understand this topic, the first issue I think we need to examine is the, this belief that cycling is typically known as a, a low weight bearing sport. But the question is, is it, is it really a low weight bearing sport uh, in, in, in reality? Uh, you know, sometimes an individual may sustain a running related injury or a walking related injury, and they may need to, you know, they're, and they're told by, by clinicians, oh, you know, you need to reduce your, your weight bearing load and, and you are advised to take up some, some sport to cross train and, and cycling is usually at, at the top of that, of that list. Um, and, 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 you know, um, but the question is, you know, is it really, really uh, a low weight bearing sport uh, if, if, you, if you examine the, uh, the, the, the sport uh, itself? Well, uh, this, might, this might actually surprise some of you, but do you know that uh, according to research, a cyclist may apply half its uh, body weight to the pedals while cycling seated and, and up to three times their body weight while cycling uh, standing? Uh, adding on to the fact that a trained cyclist may average up to 5,700 revolutions an hour, it, is, it, may not be the it may not necessarily be the low weight bearing sport that it is made out to be. Um, for this reason, the interaction between the uh, lower limb and the foot shoe pedal interface deserves uh, special consideration, both from a perspective of trying to minimize um, uh, injury and also to maximize performance. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at the, the contact phase, uh, it, is, it is an interface where high amounts of force is being placed uh, where the shoe attaches to the pedal. And this is, a very, this is typically a very focal area where this force is actually uh, being, being trans transmitted. Due to the very uh, repetitive nature of, uh, of, 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 the, of the sport, uh, this also presents a scenario where uh, it, it 
presents a risk of injury, uh, not, just, not just along at the foot, but also along the entire kinetic chain of the, of the lower limb, including the hips and the knees. Now, from an injury pre uh, prevention perspective, uh, this, this interface is, is crucial. Uh, I know Michael and Tim have touched on, has touched on, uh, on, on uh, injury prevention. And, and I, I totally agree that uh, to this end, you know, uh, with, with their thoughts that uh, injuries that we typically see in cycling are, are what we call overuse injuries, uh, where there is just too much load going through uh, a certain tissue or structure, and the structure doesn't have sufficient capacity to absorb or manage that load. With the repetitive nature of, of cycling, uh, this predis predisposes itself as a big risk factor. Uh, you know, due to the high forces and or, or the low repetitive forces that that a joint or tissue may may actually uh, receive, uh, the knee is the most common uh, site of, of lower limb, lower limb injury at forty one percent. I think I think Michael touched on that, uh, and it is it is unsurprising considering that most uh, forces actually um, uh, of the lower limb go through the knee, and it's a very crucial uh, hinge joint, and, and it and it withstands high amount of load and forces uh, during the the action of pedaling. Uh, Interestingly, you know, this cyclist you see on the, uh, on the screen here, his name is Cadell Evans. Uh, he is one of Australia's most successful cyclists. And uh, I think in 2008, he uh, actually uh, sustained a knee injury, both of his ACL and his patella tendon, uh, which actually hampered his Tour de France preparation. Uh, and, and he didn't actually uh, have a very good season because of that injury. So this is, so this is from the injury uh, prevention perspective. Now, um, the other aspect where the foot shoe pedal interface is, uh, is, is of great interest is in the performance aspect. And I would like to show you a video to illustrate uh, this point. Okay, this video is not playing. Um, okay, hang on. Just bear with me. It plays better from here. That was me again. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Right. Um. Yeah. So, so as you can see in the video, uh, that I just played, you know, uh, the winner, uh, Matthew Van Der Poel, one of the best cyclists in the, in the world, won by less than a, a meter. And to give you some context, uh, this was after a six-hour race, you know, covering 260 km, and the difference between between winning and losing was was just less than a meter, uh, and that's that's a fraction of a percentage that that you know that comes out of the of the of the winner winner and the losers uh, uh, time. So because the foot shoe uh, pedal interface is where the rider pushes down to generate the force that that uh, allows the the bicycle and the rider to propel itself forward and hence go fast. Um, you, the, this, this, this is viewed from a, from a, this is of great interest from a, from a performance uh, perspective because uh, optimizing this interface would allow efficient uh, transfer of force and power and, and hence lead to better performance. Uh, going back to our earlier point on how a cyclist can do up to 7,000, uh, 5,700 revolutions uh, uh, per hour and, and in bike races like this, uh, go up to six hours. Uh, any small inefficiencies during the pedal motion can be very significant when accumulated, uh, especially when the difference between winning and losing is so small. Um, likewise, any small gains can can be also can also be very significant uh, when when accumulated over uh, this this time frame. So the question is, how, how do we how do we achieve these goals? I, I think a good um, Starting point would be to to examine the fundamental challenge uh, uh, that we that we face when meeting these goals. Now, I think the, the fundamental challenge that, that we face is that um, we when you're put when you uh, when you're putting a a, a a a human body onto a bicycle, essentially what you're doing is that you are taking an asymmetrical human body 
and you're putting it on and making the body function against a completely symmetrical uh, bicycle. And, and, and you're getting, and you're wanting the human to, you know, push hard onto, onto this symmetrical machine when the human body is, is asymmetrical. Uh, and, and because of this asymmet asymmetry, it leads to increased repetitive forces in some tissues more than others, which is the recipe for injury. This also doesn't lend itself to a complete mechanical efficiency. If you think uh, biomechanically, when, when the rider is pushing down onto the pedals, uh, which also may affect performance. So what, what are we essentially trying to achieve uh, in terms of, of lower limb movement when, when, when the, the rider is, is pedaling? I'm gonna try to play this video here, sorry. Uh, it's my, I, I don't think it's crucial, but essentially uh, what you're trying to do is that you are trying to uh, allow the lower, the lower limb of the, of the cyclist, it, you know, the, the legs, to, to pedal as, as linearly as possible, you know. So in essence, what you want to see uh, when a cyclist is pedaling efficiently is for is their lower limbs to, lift, to, be, to be powering like pistons, you know, up and down uh, on a stable platform of, of the hip and pelvis. Uh, this, this will achieve the best efficiency for, for performance and also reduce the, the rotational forces that you see along, along the, the kinetic chain of, of the lower limb. Uh, which is uh, which is commonly a, a, a reason for for injury. So, so comp so so essentially, what um, you are trying to 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 achieve is is complete uh, linear movement uh, with li little or no side to side frontal plane motion. You know, so if, like like I said, if you're viewing it from the front, you want um, very little uh, you know side to side movement, but legs firing, firing like, 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 uh, like, pist like pistons. And then that is the ideal uh, movement pattern. Uh, in, in fact, you know, if you think about it, the, the ideal uh, uh, human body would be one where, uh, any human, human body made for the bicycle would be one where the lower limbs can move only vertically, like up and down, with little or no rotational movement. Um, but, you know, of course, this is, this is not possible. Uh, a question I, I, I get asked, asked a lot is that, uh, why do why why do cycling uh, why do why do uh, patients or, or, or riders you know feel so different when they uh, when they cycle uh, as compared to when they run and walk? You know, some some I say I I I I cycle and I cycle for hours, but when I start walking and running, you know, and I go for like a five k run, I'm completely sore the next day. Uh, well, the, the key difference is that uh, the movements are, are quite different. Where in cycling, you you are actually having the, the rider uh, being attached to uh, the, the rider's limbs to be attached to the pedals, and this is a, a closed chain uh, kinetic movement. Where, whereas in running and walking, you know the, the, the lower limbs are free and floating in the air, uh, as, as you would, you know, uh, picture yourself running and walking. And hence, um, uh, this is called uh, an open chain movement. So, um, th uh, when 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 you put the body um, uh, attached to the bicycle uh, and, and asking it to function against the backdrop of the machine, this this is where the body needs to be aligned. Uh, to the body, uh, this is where the body needs to be aligned to the to the bicycle as much as possible. Uh, a final point I would like to make is that not every cyclist can be put into this completely linear position um, due to the functional and structural limitations of, of, of the of the human body. You know the asymmetry. Uh, for example, a rider might have a high Q angle, you know, wide hips, uh, and, and hence uh, a, a fairly wide Q angle, and and it's very it's hence very challenging to be placed in in this uh, um, linear uh, position. Um, and and, and um, to achieve this complete uh, linearity in, in, in pedaling, so what you are what you are actually trying to achieve is is relative uh, linearity of a rider within their functional and structural capacity. And this is where you know uh, if you if you go to train as, as a bike fitter or mat, uh, as a physio, this is where they would uh, I suppose assess um, your uh, the, the the individual's functional and structural capacities. And then try to, uh, as much as possible, you know, fit them to the to the bicycle or, or, or give them exercises to to be able to uh, to achieve this uh, this uh, ideal linearity uh, linear uh, cycling position. So the like, so uh, the question is, who helps with this linearity? I think I've already given the answer away, and and the and the answer is, you know, a bike fitter. And I uh, I, I think Tim has actually uh, gave a great explanation of what he does. So I'm not gonna. Um, uh, try to you know uh, uh, um, 
uh, repeat what he what he has already explained. But essentially, you know, uh, I guess you know the, the bike fitter is trying to to, to align the rider and uh, to the bicycle within their, their individual functional capacities. Uh, and part of this process, of course, is to optimize the foot uh, shoe pedal interface for the reasons mentioned earlier. So the, when we look at the foot shoe pedal interface, uh, a, var a variety of interventions are used uh, to achieve these goals of in injury prevention and also to maximize uh, comfort and performance. Uh, these include the, the uh, modifi modification and selection of footwear, the use of uh, insoles, um, wedges, uh, and you know, modification and selection of, of, of pedals. Uh, by selecting and, and, prescribe, and prescribing this, these uh, right interventions, um, these goals can be met, and we, we will look at these uh, interventions very shortly. Um, before before we, we look at these interventions, um, I think it's good to touch on the pedal cycle as I, I believe it gives us uh, a good idea of the demands of, of pedaling and why, 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 the, why some equipment at the foot shoe pedal interface uh, are made the way they are. Uh, as you can see, uh, the pedal revolution is, is, is concentric and is in, is, is in a symmetrical circle. But when you break it down, the, the pedal revolution is not completely uh, equal. Uh, in general, there are two two main phases in a, in a pedal um, in a pedal cycle. Uh, one is the power phase, where most force is generated as the rider pushes down onto the pedal, and this is approximately from the twelve to the five o'clock position. And the pulling phase, which is the eight to the twelve o'clock position, up up this way. Uh, as you, and you can see, the ankle is actually in, in different positions uh, during the during the pedal stroke. You know, slightly pointed uh, downwards. You know, at certain points and and pointed upwards at different points. Uh, and, and this is, this is um, made possible, uh, and, and the, the efficiency of this is, is made possible mostly by um, the fact that the foot is actually locked into the pedals uh, um, using, using cleat and, 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 and you know, the pedal interface, but more on this later. Uh, cyclists um, aim to achieve as, as smooth a smooth pe pedal revolution uh, when they cycle, uh, and they want to, to transit through these uh, phases seamlessly, uh, attaining a nice uh, circular ped pedaling motion. Uh, this is optimal for performance and also injury prevention uh, strategy. And, and we've now with modern uh, power meters, uh, which are pedal, uh, which, which some come with, uh, with, with pedal measurement devices, you know, riders can actually practice uh, pedaling uh, efficient, uh, efficiently, uh, you know, uh, with, with, uh, with the help of these devices. Uh, and it is also um, for that reason that the foot and the shoe is commonly attached to the forefoot region. Uh, thus allowing uh, adequate uh, ankle motion when they pedal to achieve this uh, pedal revolution. Uh, if you if you just imagine if the if the if the foot was attached uh, not in the forefoot but in the midfoot the rear foot, then it is quite difficult for for this smooth um, pedal uh, revolution to be to be achieved. Uh, hence, this is why you see with most cycling shoes uh, the cleat, which is this. Uh, yellow black portion you see here on the screen is, is placed mostly in the forefoot region. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if you have cycling shoes or, 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 or if you, you know, uh, happen to see one, you will see that the cycling shoe has drill holes uh, for these cleat attachments uh, where the cleats are actually screwed in. Um, just a little bit about, about the, the cleat position. The starting point for, for cleat position is, is is uh, a neutral cleat position, you know, where where uh, you if you ask if you are fitted for the first time and, and you know and this is where you you want your foot to function from, um, the the neutral foot position is is is, is where uh, these cleats will be fitted. Uh, this is where the cleat is approximately in the center of the of the forefoot. So if so that when the foot is actually clipped into the to the uh, pedal, uh, it allows the, the pedal spindle, which is this portion here. To be about five millimeters to one cm behind the the big toe joint here, and about um and, and in line actually with the with the fifth uh, uh toe joint uh, here. Uh, once this neutral foot position has been achieved, uh you know adjustments can be made from 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 this point where the, the foot may be rotated in or out depending on the rider's uh, needs. Next, uh, clipless pedals and and and, and cleats. So. 
it is because this pedals and cleats are, are now ubiquitous. You know, you will see if any recreational cyclist or, or cyclist who owns a road bike or, or even a mountain bike almost will be using a cleatless uh, pedal and, and cleat. Um, and and actually, this this cleat and pedal technology is is actually something fairly recent. Um, and and it might surprise you that this was only introduced in the in the, in the 1990s, so not not uh, not too long ago. Uh, this technology allows uh, the foot and, and the shoe to be locked in, uh, locked into the pedal during the entire pedal stroke, like you see here. Um, and um, this locking in allows improved power transfer, as we as we discussed briefly just now, and also and also allows um, uh, better coordination. You know, where 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 the foot is because it's attached to the pedal interface. Uh, this 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 uh, the mus the the lower limb muscles can coordinate itself better. To achieve, um, you know, uh, power during the downstroke, but also uh, power during the upstroke, where you can actually pull up against the the, the pedal. So, because of that, the, the pedal revolution is, is a lot more uh, efficient. Because not only are you generating power on the downstroke when you are when you're pushing down, but on the upstroke as well, you're pulling up against the pedals, hence generating uh, a power during the, this pedal stroke and allowing yourself to go faster. Um, However, you know, uh, as with most things, you know, there are plus sides, but also there are downsides. Uh, because of this, you know, there is higher risk of foot-related foot -related problems because of the force being concentrated on a focal point uh, over over a period of time. You know, it, the cleat is commonly under the, the fourth foot and whenever you pedal, you're pressing down and, and forces are going through this very focal region. And it gives, uh, you know, issues like hot spots uh, under the cleat pedal area. Uh, especially later on in 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 a, in a, in a, in a long hot bike ride, uh, and adding on to the fact that modern cycling shoes are made of very uh, stiff carbon, this this heightens the amount of pressure and, and forces uh, going through this area, leading to discomfort, pain, and, and even injury. So, just just a bit more on 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 uh, clipless pedals and cleats. Uh, clipless pedals and and cleats are are are. You know, uh, there, there, there's a large variety that you actually uh, see see on the market, uh, and and by and large, mo most of uh, the different models all work uh, similarly. You know, essentially, what you're trying to do is to clip and lock the, the foot into the pedal. Uh, one important thing to appreciate about the clipless pedals and cleats is this thing called float. So basically, what float is is is, is actually the amount of of movement that the cleat is able to move within the pedal. Uh, and and this allows the um, the pedal to um, the cleat to translate itself in the pedal in in different directions. Um, as you can see here, this from this uh, uh, picture here, you can see that um, this branch Shimano has three different different cleat colors, uh, which allows three different amounts of float. So the red one doesn't allow any float. Zero degrees, uh, you know, two degrees for the blue and six degrees um, for for the uh, for the yellow one. So uh, this is essential, but because by by having different amounts of of, of float, it allows a certain um, give and certain room of er uh, room for error for the for the rider. Uh, in the event they cannot tolerate this, you know, linear position that they've been placed in, or they they haven't actually um, uh, positioned their cleat properly. Uh, so, for example, if you might have a niggly knee uh, where uh, your knee is a bit sore, you know, uh, when, whenever you cycle, you might want to choose uh, to go with the yellow Shimano cleats the six degree ones, which allows you six degrees of float so that your knee can find its best position when you pedal uh, instead of the zero degree uh, uh, rate cleats, which don't allow any, uh, uh, you know, movement and on this zero degree, degrees of float. Uh, so, and, and also the, the point I also want to make on, on this on float is that uh, in essence, a certain balance has to be struck uh, with, with cleat choice and, and the amount of float. Uh, because if you have too little float, um, you might place the limb in, a, in an undesirable position where uh, you might cause discomfort, injury, pain, uh, but having too much float where, you know, the foot is moving too much and the lower limb is not actually, um, uh, you know, it, it, it pushing in a linear manner can also lead to performance inefficiencies. So uh, it is fairly nuanced and, and needs a, a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, guided attention uh, to, to choose to choose. Uh, the right cleat choice, but, but also the right uh, types of pedals because different pedals and different cleat combinations give you different, different degrees of float. Now, uh, cycling shoes. So, 
um, with cycling shoes, I think there are, there are several um, distinctive features that a modern day cycling shoe uh, would have. Uh, but in essence, a cycling shoe uh, uh, that, that, that cyclists pref uh, would, would, would prefer is one that is tight, it's secure, and, and it's uh, stiff. So cyclists in general uh, don't like uh, any perceived sensations of movement, as that might mean that they are not pedaling efficiently. Uh, efficiently. Um, personally, I think shoe choice is absolutely uh, fundamental when, when we look at this uh, shoe pedal interface. And I think it's actually a, a very underrated aspect uh, when, when we actually try to sort out problems uh, at this uh, shoe pedal interface. And the reason is, is because um, there is really so little space in the cycling shoe and, and it's worn so tightly uh, and closely to the foot. Uh, and with too many, so much, uh, and such high amount of forces going through the, the uh, foot shoe pedal interface, the, the biggest element is actually the, the shoe. So having um, a properly fitted shoe is, is something that, um, that, that suits the cyclist's need. You know, not necessarily the, 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 the best shoe or, or what, is, what is the most popular uh, is, is, is something that is absolutely essential. And I think it can go a, a long way. Uh, with preventing of, 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 of injuries and, and in managing a, a, you know, common foot problems that cyclists might face. Um, just, a, uh, the, 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 just to touch on a little, a little bit on, on the foot problems, you know, cyclists uh, will commonly come in with, with hot spots, you know, like, like we mentioned, just a focal area of, of pain. Oops, sorry. Focal area of pain um, uh, under a certain portion of the foot. Uh, clot toes, big toe bunions, uh, neuromas, neuromas, which are inflamed nerves, uh, and, and tailor's bunions, which are actually, uh, uh, you know, the, the fifth big toe joint, uh, sorry, the fifth uh, toe joint uh, bunion on the opposite side of the, on the outside of the foot. Uh, and this is, and these problems are almost directly the result of, of um, uh, you know, a tight, tightly worn fitted shoe and high amount of forces that are, are being applied to, the, to that, to that uh, area. Now, I just thought it was uh, interesting to show this, um, which is actually a, a, a pictures of what pro cyclists actually do to their own personal shoes uh, to increase comfort levels. Uh, as you would know, pro cyclists are, are, are you know, uh, individuals which, you know, uh, do this for a living. So, they're in their, in, you know, this is part of their day-to-day -day wear and, and they spend a high amount of hours, you know, uh, in these shoes and, and, and pushing hard. Uh, because sometimes they are not, uh, because sometimes they are constrained by sponsorship demands, they have to stick to one sh one type of shoe than than the, than, than others. Um, so they, uh, which may not actually suit them. So um, they they actually do uh, you know certain modifications in in in, in, uh, in their shoes um, just to actually uh, uh, increase the level of comfort. So you can see here that that most uh, uh, almost all these pictures have have you know modifications to the the outside portion of the foot over. The, the fifth toe joint, um, and this is because you can see this is quite clear here on the on the bottom left screen. You know, the short peaking out, uh, and this is because you know um, uh, I think most pro cyclists because of the tight shoes, they they get a lot of pressure at, at the fifth big, uh, fifth toe, uh, toe joint area. Um, so you know, uh, commonly a little slip on top of the area would actually uh, release some pressure. Um, if you are like this, either and you have a bit more. Um, um, you know, you have uh, you you have a bit, bit more injury. Uh, uh, you know, companies might even uh, put a, a, a panel here instead of you know having to do your own DIY stitch to to increase um, the the level of comfort. Yeah, so it's it's good to know that uh, um, uh, you know um, pro cyclists also experience such problems. Uh, and 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 you know, and I think this is a good case in point that that uh, more attention needs to be paid. Uh, in this area to, to increase uh, comfort and, 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 and prevent uh, uh, pain and discomfort. Now, uh, when we look at foot uh, insoles, insoles and wedges, uh, the aim is to, to prevent uh, injury, uh, improve comfort and maximize performance. And the proposed uh, mechanism for this to, to uh, the proposed mechanism of action, sorry, to, to achieve this, uh, uh, the, the, this outcome is to promote a linear pedaling motion. So as you can see here, uh, without the, the wedge or the, uh, the insole, you know, when you pedal down, the, the knee is moving to the side and, you know, you have rotation of the lower limb, but putting something under the foot uh, is purportedly uh, uh, beneficial in allowing the lower limb to pedal, uh, uh, to move, sorry, in, in, a, in a linear motion when, when pedaling. Um, so, um, 
through this through this mechanism of action, you know, it is thought to be to be then, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is thought to then allow riders to to then uh, achieve their goals of what they want, you know, in terms of uh, comfort, uh, uh, injury prevention, and 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 to increase performance. And 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 um, this is some this is what is proposed, and we will discuss whether this is actually the uh, uh, this is actually um, uh, true in real in reality or not. Now, with uh, now, uh, so let's let's start by speaking about photosynthesis uh, or, or insoles, as, as what they're commonly known. Uh, these these devices are thought to be the most beneficial in 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 improving power transfer and and reducing injury by uh, reducing foot motion. So you know you reduce the amount of uh, rolling in of the foot, uh, and hence uh, you then achieve the uh, you then help to increase the the, uh, the the functioning of the lower limb, and and uh, the, the the entire lower limb can then move in a linear pattern. Uh, while this is what this is still uh, debated and equivocal. Uh, I, I think a lesser known benefit um, would be that insoles actually help to modulate. Um, to, to manage pressures under under the foot, so as to ensure that there are no hot spots uh, uh, um, uh, in any one portion of of the of of, of the foot when when pedaling, and and the, the and how how this is done is that the inso actually tries uh, um, uh, to contour to closely contour the, the entire bottom portion of the foot, and by doing so, uh, it spreads pressures across the entire uh, 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 portion of the foot. So that there is no one single uh, high pressure point or, or high uh, uh, stress point, thereby eliminating uh, issues like hot spots or, or areas of discomfort. Uh, another area that that um, this this insole is, is thought to to to, to uh, benefit uh, a rider is to increase um, uh, sensory sensory feedback. So by contouring the bottom of the foot. And uh, by allowing this this uh, insole to, to closely hug the foot, uh, riders can can then uh, send the, the 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 foot position a bit better, right? Which then helps uh, with the pedaling motion and and increase performance. Uh, the the key characteristics of a well made cycling insole is that one that it is uh, relatively stiff, uh, it is thin uh, thin and slim, and uh, it, uh, it is lightweight. Um, in my opinion, I think it is extremely, extremely important that the insole is uh, a thin and slim, uh, as there's very little space already in a cycling shoe, as, as we've already discussed, um, and b that it is lightweight. Because uh, if you think about the pedaling motion, you know it is the 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 insole in the shoe adds to the rotational mass of 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 the of the rider when when the rider is pedaling. So something adding something you know uh, heavier in there. Can actually uh, uh, um, reduce the performance of, of, of the cyclist. Uh, the final point I want to make about uh, cycling insoles is that it has to be uh, different from a from pair of insoles that is used for walking and running. And and the key re key obvious reason is that you know they're obviously two different motions. Um, so characteristics that you find in, in an insole that is used for for, for one one one. Sport like cycling might totally be be uh, be un unsuitable for for walking and running. Uh, so so if you know uh, a, 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 an example would be you know cycling insoles are usually made very stiff. So if you use this stiff insole and you walk and run, you know you you might end up uh, with a lot of pain discomfort. Uh, on the opposite end, if you have uh, if you use a pair of walking and running shoes, uh, walking and running uh, insoles for for cycling, you know they are made a bit bit stiffer and, and more bulky. Uh, so if you put them in a, into your tight cycling shoe, you're going to have uh, you know uh, space constriction issues, which might also lead to pain uh, and discomfort. Uh, next, uh, in shoe in shoe wedges. So um, these these wedges are typically uh, thicker, uh, are placed under the forefoot here, as you can see, and they're typically thicker on one side than the other. So you can see at the bottom of the screen here that you know this one uh, when you put when you look at the cross section, they are thicker on the inside and thinner on the outside. Uh, most common, uh, more, these wedges are commonly um, uh, are, 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 are wedges that are, are, uh, are what we call four foot various wedges, uh, where it is thicker, thicker on the inside and thinner on the outside. Um, and, and the common uh, assumption is that, you know, uh, 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 cyclists have, have this thing called a four foot uh, uh, various, um, which, which is inefficient for cycling, cyclists. 
Um, I don't want to get into the technicalities of this of this uh, assumption, but uh, I would just like to say that this this um, assumption has been has been debunked. Uh, nonetheless, you know, you as you if you look at um, different cycling shoes uh, uh, and 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 this 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 wedging uh, perspective, uh, some cycling shoes have actually built um, these wedges into 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 the sole of the shoe and uh, specialized. You know, the big a big cycling brand has actually uh, done so. Uh, and, and the last of these devices that I want to touch on is, is, uh, is one uh, uh, that, that is called shims or, or out shoe wedges. Uh, and this is, this is where the, 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 the shim or the wedge is placed in between the cleat and the sole of the shoe. So you can see it's, it's wedged in between here and you're looking at the underside of the shoe. Uh, it, is, it, it, it may be made in a, you know, a, a, neutral, um, uh, a neutral shim where, where it's essentially flat, you know, with no, uh, it's not thicker on one side or the other. Or it could be a, a various or or vulgar switch where it's, it's, it might be taken on the inside or outside and thinner on the opposite end. Uh, these it, these wedges are, are are typically used to manage uh, knee loads or to to help manage um, uh, limb discrepancies. Um, and I think Tim actually mentioned about these uh, uh, the use of these uh, in his case study, um, where you know you actually build up one one side of lower limb uh, more than more than uh, the other. And hence, it, it can actually, uh, uh, you know, give uh, uh, alleviation to to uh, pelvis or hip issues or or, or pending inefficiencies that you might see. Um, am I good for time? Sorry, uh, Joshua. Because uh, if I'm not, then I'll just skip the research part, which is uh, which which might be, you know, which might not interest the 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 the, the bulk of the audience. Sorry, can anyone hear me? Sorry, Joshua, I think you might be muted. Yeah, but uh, sorry, uh, am I am I uh, good for time or oh, I'll just fine, uh, time, Joshua, but uh yeah, I think can uh go ahead, but we might be just uh slightly short of time uh, at this point in time. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um so anyway, I'll I'll just give a a very very, very brief uh 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 overview of the research. So basically, I wanted to speak on, on the research uh, uh, studies that I've done. Uh, but like I said, I think it will interest some people more than others. Uh, so if you're actually keen on, do, on, on hearing uh, the research that I actually I've, 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 uh, I've been involved in on, on this topic, you know, you can you're feel free to contact me by emails at, at the end of the end of the presentation. Uh, and I'll be happy to you know, send you the, this portion of the slide or, or chat more. But in the interest of time, I'll skip to the, um, the closing. Uh, where uh, I'll just give you know four four take home messages, um, and the first of it being um, to if 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 you are uh, thinking of optimizing this area, uh, you know the foot shoe pedal interface. I think the first thing uh, anyone should do is to work with a bike fitter. Um, you know, so so go look for Tim. You know, and 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 the reason is because I think uh, there's a certain level of uh, industry knowledge uh, of the equipment that that cyclists uh, uh, use. And, and and you need um, a trained eye to assess for uh, you know uh, functional and structural limitations that your body your body uh, experiences uh, and 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 then uh, having this this um, this this knowledge to actually uh, put you in the best possible position on the bicycle. So it may not be the most aggressive position. It may not be the most um, you know sexy position. But I, but you know it's 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 a position that your body can actually uh, work work uh, best best from uh, in the context of your own uh, cycling goals. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, when uh, like like I mentioned, you know, the focus on footwear selection, and I think this is like I said, this is super super important because. Uh, if you can if you can see on the screen here, you know with with all these shoes, uh, just by eyeballing, you can tell that, that the shoes are all the shoes are not made equal. So you can see some shoes have a much narrower heel contour, like like you know the CD shoe here, whereas this shoe on the extreme left has a much wider contour, and you know this uh, this shoe has a wider toe box as compared to uh, this CD shoe here. So uh, there are a variety of, of of different shoes with you know different different shapes, different uh, fixation mechanisms, different stiffness, different pole box widths, different uh, heel cups, so on and so forth. And, and it is uh, it is in, uh, important that that uh, you choose the shoe that is most appropriate to you uh, because, like I said, it's 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 
worn so tightly against your foot. So any any uh, um, this any uh, 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 fit issues, you know, uh, when when you are actually uh, cycling can be, will play up, you know, uh, very very um, uh, easily. Um, so choo- I would I would I would suggest to choose um, uh, uh, one. Uh, try different shoes. Sorry, try different shoes. Find out which is the most comfortable shoe for you. And once you've found uh, a particular shoe that's most comfortable comfortable for you, chances are that the, the uh, that particular brand. Uh, would have created shoes that are suited for your feet because shoes are made from you know last uh, uh, in, in the factory. So the last is probably um, uh, suited uh, for, for for your foot. Um, you know, and, and if you if you really like the shoe, I would even suggesting uh, I would even suggest to stockpile the shoe. You know, that particular brand because you know sometimes you know this season they, they might create a shoe that is uh, that you find comfortable, but the next season the uh, the same brand might create a shoe that's not so comfortable. Uh, and it, this is something that's quite common you know, with 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 riders who are who are um, uh, you know uh, who 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 uh, you know uh, take their cycling quite seriously. And and like I said, uh, it is quite common for foot and lower limb problems to come from an ill-fitted shoe, uh, and also uh, uh, issues with their cleat positioning. So these are the two areas that I suggest that um, that that you you uh, focus on when if you're looking at, at this area. Uh, third, I think it's important to. To uh, uh, perform core and strengthening exercises, uh, so echoing what uh, Michael has mentioned, um, and, and we didn't coordinate our our take home messages. Let me just uh, say that, but I think uh, it is uh, extra essential because if if you look at the scenarios where the foot uh, and ankle and the lower limb uh, 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 issues tend to happen, it is it is that it tends to happen when the when when the, the rider is is you know has gone on the hard ride and is and or has pushed hard on the pedals, and, and typically you know they are in a position like this, you know. Where their, their trunk is flexed, you know, their elbows are bent, and they are pushing hard against, uh, you know, the, the pedals. So if you can just imagine if your if your if your core and your back, for example, is, is not strong, you know, and you and you're in this position quite uh, quite a lot, you will then you know uh, uh, push extra hard against the pedals, or your or your or, or your movement is not controlled, which would then lead to you know an unnecessary amount of force being placed on the pedals, uh, which would then lead to lower limb and and, and foot and ankle issues. Um, so common uh, exercises that you know you can do. I think Michael also gave a, a, an overview on this. Is 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 one is you know what what I like to do and I actually do myself is is a dead bug you know and and you can see with pro cyclists you know they have an, an, an exceptional level of core strength and 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 control. Uh, this is Peter Sagan on his on his uh, gym regimen and you can see that he has the core strength and control of a gymnast. Uh, and 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 um, you know it's something that you know, mere mortals like us can only dream of. Uh, last but not least, uh, if you're looking at at, at insoles, uh, I think that the key characteristics you are, you want in an insole is that it needs to be thin, it needs to be slim, and it needs to be light. Um, and having a device that is not so might actually create more problems than if you didn't actually have an insole. Uh, so far, you know, if you ask me how how do insoles actually work and how do they do they benefit a rider, uh, I think they they generally. Uh, um, uh, benefit rider from 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 these three um, uh, 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 mechanisms. You know, to, uh, it manages foot pressure under the foot. Uh, it, it increases sensory feedback, uh, and when, and it may also help with the joint alignment of your of your of your low limb and your pedal. But I think these needs these uh, uh, for this to to happen, you need a, a, a bespoke device, and and it works on a case by case basis. Um, and that's that's about it. Thank you so much for listening. And sorry, I went a little bit over time. Uh, thank you, Bunkya. Uh, Bunkya, would you be able to close? Um, I think there's some technical difficulties, but no worries. Um, we'll try to address some of the uh, questions that we have in the chat. Okay, first we'll start with the first one, um, um, which is by Mr. Kelvin Ho. Um, what are some immediate parameters you can use to measure physiological stress to match the uh, mechanical stress? Uh, perhaps, uh, Michael, you may be able to take that. Thanks, Bella. Um, 
things like uh, one of the, one of the most popular ones at the moment is uh, a thing called heart rate variability, and uh, these days the the quality of the devices that can do that uh, are, they're, they're vast. So um, uh, heart rate variability gives you a simple snapshot uh, uh, of how physically prepared you're to undertake a certain training session that day. Uh, it's usually measured while you sleep and when you first wake up. Um, that, that's one of the most common ones. Lots of recreational athletes are, are using that. Um, and also um, doing it, doing, we all do this ourselves, uh, a self-assessment of our perceived, perceived vigor or, or our, our, our gen, generalized feeling of vitality. We all know we've had a long day at work and we've got a planned training session that evening. And uh, as you're preparing for that training session, if every cell in your body is saying, you don't really feel like doing this, then that, that's a sign that you're under a fair bit of physiological stress. Um, so, so right at the very point when you're about to undertake a training session, um, ask yourself, how, how, how do I feel? How motivated am I feeling? How's my general uh, muscle soreness or tightness? Um, and, and mentally, how, how energetic do I feel to undertake this session? That, that in itself um, is, a, is a, a proven measure to, to work out uh, how much physiological stress you've uh, had to absorb in the previous 24 to 48 hours, and also to how well you can balance out um, whether you're physically prepared to cope with the me mechanical stress you plan for. And that's where you can then modulate the training. So if on a particular day, um, you only got about six hours sleep, you had a long day at work the night before, you get up in the morning, um, you start your warm up and you just, your legs are feeling heavy and you're tired and, and in your mind, you're not feeling motivated. That's when you should really modulate the workout and maybe not, not skip the training session, but just do a much easier training session, like a recovery session. Uh, because before you know it, um, in the next couple of days, that, that, uh, that training session where you hit hit some perfect numbers will be just around the corner. But if you don't allow yourself those easier training sessions according to how you're feeling, the really good training sessions never come and you start digging a hole for yourself over a period of time. Thanks, Michael, for that. Sure, um, sure. We have the next question actually for Timothy. I think it's a, it's a relatively straightforward one about qualifications for bike fitters. How would one, um, you know, uh, be able to get a qualified or know that a certain bike fitter is qualified? Anything to look up for? Yeah, I think um, so. There's this uh, international body that that is probably um, the most right now. They, they are like the sort of the authority over the bike fitting in the world. It's called the International Bike Fitting Institute. Yeah, it's a it's a UK based. Uh, set up and what they're trying to do is they're trying to formalize bike fit education as as a as sort of like a, a university degree yeah it, it's not it's in progress so they're trying to map like courses to certain modules and uh, yeah so so any, any bike fitter can can sign up as a member and when you get accredited you gain certain points if you are a medical professional and you have uh, like a physio qualification or you're a medical doctor, you also get certain points. So then this, they add up these points and they give you a, a, a certain level of qualification. Yeah, so I would think that that's a good place to start. Is it, uh, is it a database where someone can check, let's say a potential customer? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, you can go to the International Bike Fitting Institute website. Yeah, and then you can see all the accredited bike fitters around the world. Thanks, Timothy. The, the next question actually is uh, both for Timothy and Boone. Um, it's a bit more technical on the float that um, Boone was talking about, the cleats, the float. Um, the question would be that, you know, is it better off to actually have cleats with more float, taking into account that usually the leg has like a natural uh, rotation to it, uh, whether you do a proper backfield or not, uh, and the likelihood that, um, you know, having a pure linear kind of motion is, is, is unlikely. And then the follow-up question is that any uh, performance advantages with using uh, a clip that has zero float? Uh, 
So on the whole, like, how, how would you choose which float to use? Like, I also, I would, I, I would. See, I, see. <laughs> I, I think I'll go first and Tim can, can jump in. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that um, when, I think this, this topic of float, like I mentioned, depends, uh, uh, the cho choice of it depends on a lot on, uh, on you know, number one, the, the, the writer's uh, structural and functional uh, 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 abilities, but also their, their cycling uh, related goals. So, uh, for so for example, like I, uh, you know, if if, there's, if a rider, you know, does a lot of high sprint events or, or a high power event, um, and they really want to get you know maximum amount of force down into pedals, uh, having a float that is too much, uh, having a pedal that is, and cleat that's too much float can actually you know give them the sensation that that their, their lower limb is moving too much, and hence it's not as efficient as, as they would they would like. Uh, conversely, if you know, if you are if you are a fairly recreational rider and, and performance is not not a, such a big uh, uh, factor for you, uh, and your 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 key goal is you know look I don't want to get injured I want to enjoy my cycling and, and perhaps I don't do enough um, uh, uh, strength and conditioning work to to get my body into the position where I can you know pedal as cleanly as possible you know my hips are too tight for example then perhaps you know using a pedal that has more float. Uh, uh, sorry, I think there's more float uh, would, would then uh, be the ideal uh, uh, scenario. Yeah, Tim? Any thoughts from you, Timothy, regarding float? How would you choose or recommend? I would, I would say that the first thing to do is to understand the, the profile of the cyclist and whether there are any underlying issues or tissue of injuries. So, so for instance, uh, if, if a, a cyclist has um, issues with uh, like uh, ankle instability, sprained ankles, or any ankle ankle issues before. Uh, uh, actually, a fixed foot will actually help to stabilize the foot. Yeah, barring any knee issues that the person has. So if you if you put a cyclist that has an unstable ankle with a lot of float, then probably the calf have to work very hard to stabilize the foot to, and to deal with the float. And then of course, if a cyclist um, has certain knee issues that require float. And then uh, Boon mentioned that the knee is a hinge joint. If there's no float, then the rotation will be all at the knee. Then you actually want some float. Yeah. So for more, um, I would say that the longer kind of rides that you ride, you probably need some kind of float because as your muscles around the hips get tight anyway, the foot will want to have some kind of rotation. Yeah. So for example, if you do a time trial, 30 minutes or an hour time trial, all out effort where performance is really key, then the float would be less uh, relevant. Then you want something more fixed. I see. I have a direct question uh, to me um, from Kelvin about racing bikes and what's the optimal angle of knee uh, in extension? I suppose it's from the downstroke. Is there a, what, what is the recommended angle of the knee? Maybe Tim, is there uh, a certain angle you look up for in the bike fit? Yeah, but it's, uh, so, so the question, it's quite, this question is quite tricky because, of course, there's a normative range. So usually at, at, knee, um, at maximum knee extension, when the foot is somewhat near the bottom of the pedal stroke, usually we are looking at about 135 degrees to 155 degrees of knee extension. But, but again, it's so, it's so subjective. It really depends on the person's function, the person's flexibility. You know, someone that has a, an underlying hamstring injury, you probably want to to reduce the, the knee extension or someone who has a very inflexible um, hamstring then of course then you will be looking at at a, a lower spectrum of knee extension but again knee extension is just one variable that we or one parameter that we look at i mean you can set a, a person with a, the perfect knee angle let's say 140 degrees but then you observe that the hips and the pelvis are all over the place then obviously there's a, there's some compensated movement there yeah, so probably that that uh, knee angle should be looked at, um, not not just as a single parameter, but in tandem with other parameters. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. The uh, next. Question is by uh, Thai. Uh, in your views, uh, what are the shoes that are um, meant to be able to be customized? Or, for example, 
a lake or rocket and uh, are they actually worth the money? Uh, perhaps uh, Timothy, you can uh, help with that. They should, yeah, this, this shoes are quite expensive. Yeah, um, I, I, would, I would say that uh, from a personal point of view, they are, they are not worth the money. Yeah, a pair of, it's just so, it's, it's just because that um, there are so many off the shelf options available now. Yeah, even, even semi customizable options. So like, uh, to, to, to give a perspective, like uh, a good pair of cycling shoes, they're about 300 to $400 now. And a custom pair of shoes would probably be close to $2,000. Yeah, like from Rocket 7 and from, uh, from Siemens Racing. Yeah, and unless it's really geared. So there are two instances where people would use a, a fully custom shoe. Number one, if they have really, really odd foot, um, I mean, left and right side, or someone has underlying um, uh, disability, you know, for example, they have a restricted um, lower limb um, movement or, or a lot of leg length difference. And on the other spectrum, if the person really want um, to be like high performance and, and have a perfectly fitted shoe, yeah, then, then it makes sense. Otherwise, I think off the shelf options have a lot to offer. Maybe Boon can chime in. Ah, <laughs> uh, so I I, uh, I I agree with I agree with Tim uh, in in the in the sense that I think there are enough. Uh, off the shelf options in the market available for a, a person to actually um, get a, a suitably fitted shoe. Yeah, so in terms, if you talk about value, I think, you know, uh, they are really, you know, because these shoes are not cheap, right? So, um, um, you know, if you look at the, the, the off the shelf shoes, you know, I think you can, if you try enough shoes and you, you, you dial in on your footwear, I think you can find a shoe that is suitably, uh, that, that fits you suitably. However, in saying that, I think also this, this question is a bit skewed because um, the, a lot of shoes that are customized, I don't, uh, I don't think they are actually fully customized in the sense that some shoes say they're customized, but you know what they allow you is to actually you know keep more the, the sole of the shoe that, that you know it gives you some more contouring in the, at, at the bottom of the foot, but actually uh, and, and you know just maybe a bit uh, a more stopgap kind of measures. Uh, so I think a true customized shoe where literally the shoe, uh, you take a mold of the foot and, and the, 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 the sole is, is you know, really uh, customized to the bottom of your foot and, and you have an upper and, and, and a fixation mechanism that is, that is contoured to your foot perfectly. Actually, I do think there is, you know, that, that there is a, there's a lot to be gained there. Uh, but however, however, from a price point perspective, I, I, I think, you know, at this point in time, uh, I think it's still too expensive. Uh, and, and, and of interest, I think, uh, this 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 uh this might actually the price might actually come down with you know with with current uh, uh 3D printing technology and, and so on and so forth so uh you know with the advancement in 3D printing technology and, and it's get as it gets cheaper I think these, we would see more of these shoes uh be at a more competitive price point. Thanks. Thanks everyone for all your questions. I think we are running uh a bit over time um. Apologies to those who uh, in the chat that we didn't manage to get to your questions. But I just want to take this opportunity to thank again uh, Michael, Bukia, as well as Timothy for taking the